Okay. Just bear with me one second here. So the Soviet and US space programs became very interested in this, particularly in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the Soviets started working with it. They realized that, you know, the body seems to have these channels or meridians, um, these lines that seem to run through the body that connect up energy points. Somebody described them being like railway tracks. You know, they're like railway tracks running through the body, and at certain points there are junctions where the train would change direction or, or like railway stations. The meridians are like the railway tracks. The points are the acupressure points, acupuncture points that are scattered through the body. Now these were first They've been known for a very, very long time. Um, they were first recorded in the Emperor's Yellow Book, which I think was about four, 400 BC. But there was a body found in the Swiss Alps, or in the Italian Alps, in the Utz uh, Valley. And a man who had been climbing over the Alps about 2,000 years BC died. And his body got trapped in the snow and was frozen. And when it was discovered, and checked, it was found that his body actually had markings which had been scraped into the skin and marked with some kind of carbon or soot. And everybody thought there were just some kind of ritual tattoos that had been placed on the body. Until so one of the scientists working on the program said, actually, I'm an acupuncturist. And that guy's got arthritis because they're exactly the points I would treat somebody if they had arthritis. And when they did the autopsy on the body, Sure enough, they found elements of or evidence of arthritis in the bones, but also in the um, in the remains of the food that were in his stomach, because there were some kind of parasites that were related to arthritis, and they found evidence of these in his diet. So that's two thousand years BC. That's four thousand years ago. In Europe, people knew that you could mark somebody's body with these points, and you would give them pain relief. So this is not anything new. We're simply rediscovering it, or science is rediscovering it. So the Soviets developed something called Prognos. Uh, Prognos was an electrical system that they used to stimulate the acupressure pressure points in the body. And it was very, very effective. You know, they used it on the Mir uh, station, on the, the Mir missions, where guys would be in space for, you know, maybe six, seven months. Now, if you're outside the Earth's magnetic field, your muscles don't have anything to push against, so your muscles deteriorate quite quickly. And part of the problem when the American astronauts were coming back was, we all remember the photographs of them being lifted out of the capsule because they were so weak, because their muscles hadn't been pushing against anything, and it started to, uh, to weaken. The Russians, because they were electrically stimulating acupressure points on the body, and stimulating the muscles because of that. Simply walked straight out of the, uh, the the craft when they came back on the Mir missions. So very, very effective. And it's actually it's commercially available now. You can Google it on the web, you'll find it. Um, around the same time, NASA were starting to ask some serious questions. You know, we've gone to the moon, we've done the JFK thing, um, now what are we going to do? Well, now it was Star Trek time. Now it was going to, you know, we were going to go out, boldly go where nobody's gone before and start looking into deep space. But the question then came up, well, how, if we find some kind of strange life form, how will we know if it's a life form? Because, you know, here we use our five senses to touch and taste and feel things and smell and hear things. But when you're in space, you're constantly relying upon an instrument to tell you what's out there, because you can't physically see, touch, taste, hear what's going on. So when we find a life form, how will we know what it is? Uh, one of the people who were involved in the, this question was Barbara Brennan. Uh, Barbara was a, a NASA PhD scientist, and she was working on the program, and they started thinking about these energy fields that people were talking about, and they said, well, you know, there were people that say they can see these kind of auras around living people, um, maybe that's a starting point that we could work with. So they start bringing people into the laboratory who could see or claim they could see auras, energy fields around living things. 
and people would come in and they'd start looking at the flower and in the plant pot and go, yes, I see the, the flower, I see the leaf, and this is kind of gold and silvery shimmering light around it. And they went, okay, yeah, so you're seeing something, and somebody else would come in and say the same thing, and somebody else would come in and say the same thing. And they thought, okay, well, there seems to be something to this, because these people are replicating each other's results. They're, they're confirming what each one is seeing. And then one day, somebody came in and said, yeah, I see the, the plant and I see the, the, the energy thing, but there's this funny streamer here coming out to the left. And they had a good look at the plant and said, but there's, there's nothing there. There's, there's no damage, there's nothing growing. Um, are you sure? And said, yeah, I, I can see the energy field here, and there's this kind of streamer coming out like this. And they said, well, you know, <laughs> there's nothing there, and there's, there's nothing to indicate there's anything there. And, in every experiment, there's always a statistical anomaly. You know, there's something that doesn't fit the, the mean spread. Maybe today you're it. So this, I'm just telling you what I see. So they, they, they parked the experiment. And Barbara Brennan said that, you know, they came in, I think it was about two weeks later, and where this person had been indicating this stream of energy, there was a whole new leaf had grown into that place. And the implications of that were enormous because what was happening here was the biofield was in existence before the physical. In other words, the glove wasn't growing around the hand. The hand was growing into the glove. The energy field is the template into which the physical form grows. That's why children get bigger that as the energy field increases and expands, the body grows and fills the, the energy field. And this had enormous implications for Barbara. Um, it started to bring back memories about when she was a child, she was able to walk through the woods blindfolded and not walk into the trees because she could feel her way through them. And her, her sight, her ability to see and her sensitivity to seeing this this energy field started to come back and she started to map it. She started to record her observations. And what she found quite quickly was that this biofield is highly organized, highly structured, and it's interactive. And she applied her PhD approach, uh, her scientific approach, to mapping and analyzing and figuring out what this thing was, what were the layers in it, how did they work, how did they interact. She could see thought forms forming in the energy field. But she also started to notice the interactions between people. And I don't need to explain to you what's going on here because you can see from the energy fields exactly what's going on. So there's this constant interaction happening with the energy fields. But the really interesting thing about the energy field is I can't say where my energy field stops and your energy field starts. You know, I couldn't put a knife through the air and go, this divides us because there is no division. But then, in more recent times, with the development of quantum mechanics, uh, theoretical quantum physicists like Dr. Amit Goswami have been coming forward and saying, well, it's not just about energy, it's also it's about information. There's information out there, there's fields of information. And that we are fields, quantum fields of information, constantly interacting with our environment through non-local awareness. So whatever room that you're in now, every radio station in the world is in that room. The thing is, we don't have the receiver to pick up that particular piece of information you want to find. But if we had the right radio, if we could tune into the right frequencies, we can access any information. Now, as remote viewers, we know this already. But for me, this put a framework on why we're able to access information. So meanwhile, over at the HeartMath Institute in California, they've been looking at how we read signals from our environment. And what they found was that there was something going on in the heart before the brain would, would register information or its impulses. And they couldn't figure out why this was happening until they realized the heart has neural tissue. The heart acts like another brain. It's like an independent brain in the body. But the heart has a stronger electrical field, like a hundred times stronger 
than the brain and has a magnetic field that's 5,000 times stronger than the brain. So thinking that the brain and the brain's magnetic field is what's doing this is way off. The heart seems to be the main information gathering center. And what they found is that at the heart mass, what they find is that information enters the heart, enters into the heart center, where it creates emotion. I want to, I'm going to be very specific about the difference between emotions and feelings here. The heart creates emotion, and there are only two types of emotion. Well, there's only one type. The only emotion that there is is love. The absence of that is not love. So it's either one or the other. It processes everything as either love or not love. Based upon that, the emotions tell the brain which chemicals to release into the body. Those chemicals flood down through our physical being and they create physical feelings. The brain uses the body and the visual information from our eyes and the, uses the feelings coming in from the body and the information coming in from our eyes from our perception to calculate our safety because that's the key thing that it has to do. It has to keep us safe. So the information is coming in through the heart center, being analyzed, sent to the brain, the brain releases the chemicals, the chemicals create physical feelings, the brain then takes the feelings, takes the visual data and decides am I safe or am I secure? And again there's no third option, it's either one or the other. At the same time you've got people like Bruce Lipton. Uh, Bruce was a professor, professor of biology over at Stanford University. He actually gave up teaching biology because what he was finding in biology through his research wasn't matching what was being taught in the textbooks. He was doing, Bruce is a, is a friend of mine, um, met him last year when he came over here for a lecture. Um, we spent quite a number of hours together discussing energy psychology as it relates to epigenetics which is his field and what he was saying was that you know I was doing clone research, clone cell research back in the 50s before people even knew what it was. And even then we were finding you could take the DNA out of a cell and the cell would still exist, the cell would still work. Um, it couldn't replicate itself because it didn't have the DNA, but the cell could keep on living. And he said, you know, people think that DNA and cells and genes, it's all about the DNA. He said, no. You know, expecting DNA to do anything is like walking into an architect's office and saying, I want a house, and the architect pulling out a blueprint and going, here you go, here's a house. You'd go, no, that's not a house, that's a blueprint. I want a house. I want a, a real house. DNA is simply a blueprint, but it requires signals coming in from outside of itself to tell it what to do. So what Bruce found is that cells don't respond to DNA and genes. They respond to our emotional response to our environment our emotional response. And we know that our perception of our environment determines our beliefs. So what we have is this incredible biofield where rather than me, Paul, being this physical person, I think of myself now as being an energetic person walking around in this physical form, in this physical taxi. I have a physical body that allows me to interact with this physical environment that I find myself in, in order to have experiences. As an energetic being, I am here to have experiences and this is how I'm doing it. As I'm doing that, I'm moving through a universe which is full of information. 